Welcome to the BSU Town Hall. Just want to let everyone know that this Town Hall is being recorded. Charles Davison is the director of the Pre-Law Institute at John Jay College, both a lawyer and an educator. Dr. Davidson is deeply con committed to student success and under his leadership. John Jay has been ranked number four in the nation for producing black applicants to law school. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Hi, as Yolanda said, I'm Charles Davidson, and I'm the director of the Pre-Law Institute. Conversation. Um, and I want to welcome you all to this conversation. I see so many people that I know, uh, many friends and colleagues and John Jay um, students in the uh, participants list. And so I want to welcome you all tonight and thank you for joining us as we talk about this very important topic. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to those of you who are not part of the John Jay community, and you, although you are now, um, as we talk about a topic that um, has really captivated the entire nation in a way that few topics have um, in recent memory. Um, and I think the fact that there's so many of us here tonight speaks to the urgency of this issue, um, an issue that is, of course, newsworthy on the national level and the global level, but it's not really just a, simply a news item. This is an issue that goes to the heart of what it means, particularly for black people, what it means to be a citizen of this country and what it means to have our lives valued. So I really thank you all for joining us in this conversation, which I hope will not be uh, the last um, around these topics. We are delighted to have you all here. I'd just like to say a few things in terms of housekeeping. Um, as you all know, you are all muted by the, uh, by the host of this conversation. We have pre-selected questions. The students have pre-selected questions um, from the ones you submitted, and we will be asking those questions. Um, so you will not be able to jump in with questions. But if you do have a burning question that you feel needs to be asked, please feel free to put it in the chat. And if we have the time, uh, um, we will ask um, your question. So please feel free to express and participate whether the question is asked or not. It's really important um, that you participate because this is, of course, your forum. I'd just like to say a very quick thank you to the Black Student Union for putting this on, for being so proactive, for being so timely, um, and for really leading the charge in opening up this conversation um, for the college, but really for the larger community. Finally, I'd just like to say that we do have a our director of counseling at John Jay, Dr. Gerard Bryant, um, here with us tonight, because some of these issues, while they're important policy questions, they are also deeply um, charged issues that may be difficult for some people. So please feel free, if any of this raises any emotional difficulties for you, or you'd like to discuss something, please find Dr. Gerard Bryant, that's B-R-Y-A-N-T, in the chat, and you can speak to him directly. Um, with no further ado, I'd like to get get us started. And I want to introduce someone who's really central to this whole endeavor tonight, and that's DeCarlos Hines, who is the president of the Black Student Union at John Jay College. Uh, DeCarlos is someone I've recently met and who I've really grown very fond of very quickly. DeCarlos is a very deeply committed advocate for social justice. He's very, very concerned about issues that pertain to black people and people of color. And as the president of the John Jay Black Student Union, he has been already an, a, a serious agent for change and who serves our student body with real passion and commitment. He's very, very much interested in ending mass incarceration as so many of us are and for removing police from schools. John, uh, De Carlos is a junior at John Jay, majoring in forensic psychology, and he is very much looking forward to getting his PhD in clinical psychology. So I introduce to you the president of the Black Student Union, De Carlos Hines. Hello, and thank you all for coming. We certainly appreciate uh, you joining us uh, in our town hall. First, I'd like to introduce uh, the executive of the executives of the Black Student Union. Um, First is our Vice President, Ranisha Singleton. Welcome to this event. Then we have our Treasurer, who is Kiana Williamson. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's great to see everyone here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Then we have our Secretary, Yolanda Genti. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining today. And last but not least, we have our Chief of Staff, Gina George. Hi, good evening. Thank you all for your hard work and dedication. We definitely uh, appreciate it. We are making history today 
This is the first Black student town hall in over 25 year history of John Jay. I am excited to lead such a passionate student organization who focuses is to educate, illuminate, and celebrate Blackness. However, it is in these moments like these where we must rise and decide to come out of the shadows, rise above the fray, and let our voices be heard. As the winds of change blow across our country, it is and has always been students like us who are on the front lines of change. History has proof of this, and we will resolve to allow history to continue to show that students will never be afraid to take on hard issues, especially John Jay students, because we are fierce advocates for justice. But we need your help. We do not need allies because allies is someone who agrees or supports, but rather we need accomplices because accomplices are those who are willing to get their hands dirty and fight right long beside us, always putting other needs before their own fears. America is known for putting people into categories like thugs and blacks, felons and illegals. One of the ways to change how we see each other is to stop putting one another into these categories. We are not defined by the cloth we wear on our heads. We are not defined by the religions we choose to practice. We are not defined by the style of our hair, our sexual orientation, our fashion sense, nor should we be defined by the color of our skin. But rather, we must practice what Dr. King demanded. Let us be defined and let us define others by the content of character. This is our charge. There will be unrest in our streets as long as there's unrest in our lives. For those who are asking, when will the protesting end? We are going to protest and protest until the foundations of institutional racism and systematic oppression are broken because protesting is known to break foundational injustices as it gives rise to new ideas and much needed changes in legislation. I've come to serve notice to our generation. I've come to serve notice that our generation has come to shift the tides of racism, police brutality, and systematic oppression of our people. We demand a seat at the table. No, not the parochial seat. No, not the seat where you pretend that you hear us, but instead we demand a seat at the table that we can affect change in all levels in all departments and within every institution. Inside these walls of John Jay, we have a greater responsibility to affect change by leading the way because we are the leading institution educating 15,000 students per year to serve our communities at different levels. We cannot fail our students. We cannot fail our communities. We must rise to the occasion so that real progress can be made. The Black Student Union is serving notice to every department and every chairperson and every faculty member. The students demand real change in our curriculum and we are at the ready to apply pressure and see this all the way through. So the question we ask, are you going to be a part of the solution or are you going to be indifferent to it? And the words of Malcolm X, there comes a time when enough is enough and that time is now. Good evening. I have the pleasure of introducing our first three speakers. The first is Dr. Jessica Gordon Nemhard. She is a professor of community justice and social economic development in the Department of Africana Studies and is also the director of the McNair Post Baccalaureate Program. Next is Dr. Kevin Nadal. He is a professor of the psychology department at John Jay who specializes in microaggression. Finally, we have Dr. Veronica Johnson. She is also a professor of the psychology department at John Jay, who specializes in racial trauma. So just to get the conversation started, hello, I, you all, all my colleagues, so it's a pleasure to see you all again. Um, I'd just like to get the conversation started with uh, Dr. Gordon Emhart. Um, you've been asked to talk about this question, this idea of institutional racism. 
And this is a topic that we hear so much about now. Um, it's a topic that is being, a word that is, a phrase that's being used quite widely, I think without a lot of definitional, definitional clarity. Could you help us all, under, us all understand what is meant by institutional racism and how, how does that impact us all? I'm sorry, we're unmuted. she's unmuted now. Okay. Okay, am I unmuted now? Good, thanks. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thank right. you so much. Um, good to see everybody. Thanks to the BSU for inviting me. I do um, want us to just take a quick moment to remember the murdered and all those who still can't breathe. I want to name Eric Garner, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and you know all the rest of the list. So I just wanted us to take that moment quickly. Um, and I also always start my talks with remembering the original stewards of the land so that we remember we're on stolen property um, and that we understand that heritage. And I wanna call into this space our ancestors. And I want us to also remember all the scholar activists who we all are and I stand on the shoulders of scholar activists. So what is institutional racism? Um, I want to talk about it. I want to talk about um, structural racism because institutional racism is actually a kind of structural racism. But I need to first give you a definition of racism and anti-blackness racism. So I'll do that first. I'm trying to talk slowly because some of this stuff is a mouthful. I might repeat it a little bit to get it, but I know I only have 10 minutes, so I've got, I've got my 10 minute mark, I think, but I know you'll stop me if, I need, if you need to. Um, <laughs> So racism, right, it's the cumulative unequal relationship between social groups based on privileged access to power and resources by one group over another. And I actually got most of that definition from Manning Marable in a book he did years ago called Great Wells of Democracy. So let me repeat that. Cumulative unequal relationships based on privileged access to power and resources, one group over another. It's also justified by the myths of genetic difference, right? Hopefully all of you know now that there is no genetic difference. There are no genetic races. It's a social construct. So those myths of genetic difference perpetuate and justify racism and stereotypes, terrorism, and state violence perpetuate it. Anti-black racism is therefore looking at racism against people of African descent or black people so systems of beliefs and practices that attack, erode, and limit the humanity of black people. That's from Charlene Carruthers in her new book, uh, I guess it's not that new anymore, in her book, Unapologetic. So anti-black racism, the focus on black people, is a system of beliefs and practices that attack, erode, and limit the humanity of black people. So then how do we get to institutional and structural racism? Well, we all know about overt racism, right? That's the things we know about lynching, calling a black person the N-word or describing them as a monkey, boycotting Star Wars 7, right? Or a white police officer holding his knee on a black man's neck for over eight minutes, right? That's overt racism. It's very clear, we can see it. But what's covert racism? That's what institutional and structural racism are. They're microaggressions, they're laws and unequal impacts based on race and policies that were created because we think one race has some kind of something, privilege or something over another race or because we associate one race with certain stereotypes and another. We use code words about class when we really mean race. That's the beginnings of this covert structure. And so structural racism is therefore a system where public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms in our society work in various reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequality. And again, it's really anti-blackness racism. So again, it's all the institutions, the policies, the cultural representations in a society reinforce and perpetuate inequality and disadvantage. There are privileges that get associated with whiteness, disadvantages associated with color that adapt over time, but still um, exist even as they become more and more covert. 
They're often invisible, these practices and discriminations, but they're built into the behaviors and practices of society. So they seem normal and neutral to us. That's the other problem why structural racism and institutional racism is so insidious, because we the society sees it as normal or as neutral that we're not practicing racism, and yet the, the outcomes are still racist. The outcomes still create racial disparities, racial inequality, there's unequal impact of laws and practices. And so we can understand and see this racism if we look at impact and outcomes rather than just trying to look at behaviors and a certain incident. And finally, so institutional racism is a part of structural racism that focuses on the laws and institutions and the way they operate to perpetuate these inequalities. So they disempower communities of color, perpetuate unequal conditions, by the structures and the policies that are practiced, even though, again, they don't explicitly appear racist and they might appear neutral. And so they function in, in racist ways. The best example is the crack cocaine versus powder cocaine um, disparity in penalties, right? Most of you know about that, right? Crack cocaine is seen as uh, a drug of lower class black people Powder cocaine is seen as a drug of choice for the wealthy and it's seen as less insidious and less problematic. So you punish the crack cocaine people much, what, about five times more than you punish the people who possess powder cocaine. Um, and you say it's a neutral law, but really all the assumptions behind why you even make a difference between two cocaine, two forms of cocaine, how you punish and uh, and, in, and uh, implement the law, right, are all based on these institutional, on the institutional racism behind that. And so my last thing to say is that because of institutional racism, racial inequalities continue, right? There are deep structural barriers to equality and equity that impact those with black skin more harshly than those with white skin and perpetuate these inequalities, regardless of whether you have um, still have the overt kinds of racism in a racist society. Um, I think I'll stop there. Is that good enough? That's perfect. Uh, Dr. Gordon Emhart, you have just raised so many uh, seminal points here. Um, but one thing that I think sticks out, and we got a student question about this, one thing that you raised is this issue of the invisibility of these structural and institutional um, racist racism. And the sort of you know you know, noted that the insidious quality about it is largely its invisibility how do we and this is a student question how do we develop strategies that could be implemented in educational context that help eradicate the racism that seems to pervade them as well right so that's a great question so thanks and i'm sure more than one student probably had a similar version <laughs> of that question you know so i'm an educator so i believe and first in the power of information and understanding, right? So one of the reasons I tried to break it down as simply as I could was because that's the first step, right? I have taught, we have a class here called Institutional Racism, AFR 229, 239, whatever, sorry. I shouldn't have <laughs> yes, tried to get 39. <laughs> called Institutional Racism. <laughs> And in that class, that's the first, I spend about a month just trying to unpack all those words and all that language, because that's the first thing. We need the analysis, mm -hmm. right? And we need people to understand this thing about normality and neutrality, that, right? That we're living in a world that pretends all this stuff is normal and neutral when it isn't. And so that's the very first thing we have to do is pay, you know, make sure we, we unpack those words, pay attention to that, talk about it, and make sure people are comfortable talking about it. And I also try to use cultural ways to talk about it. So I'm not just kind of preaching, right? There's lots of um, books and poems and novels and movies that also try to illustrate some of this. So I try to pull all that in so we can really feel it and live it, right? And then, so that's the first thing, to feel it, live it, understand it and feel it and live it. And then we need to talk to other people about it. One of the great pleasures I have in being in an Africana studies class is students are telling me all the time how they talked to their parents, their friends, their siblings, and suddenly people became more clear and understood these things better. And so I actually build in assignments too, that you're supposed to interview people and talk to people. So I think that's where the education, information, communication part. 
And then the last piece, because I know we have to move on, is the policy analysis. The other thing I, I want to do, and I hope that we do in most of our classes, is to train people on how to do that deep dive and really pull apart policies, understand their origins, their impacts, their consequences, and then help people to understand how to argue and fight against those policies. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Mark, your students are very, very fortunate, and <laughs> there could be no better time to have a professor like you. Really, there couldn't be. Thank you. Um, Thank you. It's very true. Um, we're going to turn to Dr. Nadal, who, whom I've never met, but I heard so much about. So how are you? Um, Dr. Nadal, we understand that you are going to speak to us tonight about the issue of microaggressions, another term that we hear so much about, um, that I, I think there's some uh, um, perhaps lack of clarity about what it really means. What are microaggressions and how do they affect people of color, particularly black people? Sure. So thank you first for having me here. Um, I especially want to say thank you to the Carlos, who is one of my students who works with me in my research lab where we study microaggressions and has also uh, been a student in my class. And, and also just, it's very nice to see all of your faces. Uh, I know we haven't been together in community in a while. And even though we're under these horrible circumstances right now, um, it, it is just nice being in community with you all today. Um, so to, to answer your question, um, microaggressions uh, are basically a, another form of discrimination another form of oppression. Um, so like Professor Gordon Member, Member said, um, there are several types of discrimination, including institutional discrimination, systemic dis discrimination, and microaggressions um, are one way that that discrimination manifests. So microaggressions can be defined as the everyday actions, behaviors, words, and statements that people uh, say or do that convey some sort of bias uh, towards people of historically marginalized groups. Um, and so when we think about microaggressions, we're thinking about these behaviors or statements that are oftentimes uh, unintentional, that a person didn't mean to do something or say something that caused harm or hurt. Uh, they're oftentimes unconscious, where a person didn't even realize that they had even done something um, at all that caused this, this uh, uh, hurt or, uh, or, or frustration or anxiety or whatever it may have caused for the person. Um, and as a result of that, uh, people of color, in this case, black people and people of other historically marginalized groups as well, um, they navigate the world in which they're dealing with all forms of discrimination. You're navigating uh, systemic and institutional discrimination that manifests through policies, uh, through uh, anti-Black legislation um, that looks at things um, on a broader level like uh, voting rights to even interpersonal levels like uh, professors who might favor their white students over their black students. Um, and then we have uh, interpersonal interactions that occur uh, between two parties um, and one party uh, who commits a microaggression towards another person. Um, and so we're navigating all these things all at once. I um, mean, that can cause significant distress uh, to people of these historically marginalized groups. So if you are, let's say, a Black person uh, who hears of the deaths of Black people by police officers or by others, any sort of violence that may occur, um, that's going to cause you significant distress, especially when people share these videos um, and people are actually now watching this in real time. Um, and then you go to work and or to school and uh, you hear people talking about these things either in negative ways, blaming um, the, the victims or the targets of this violence, uh, assigning explanations or rationalizations as to why this sort of thing may have happened, or even people who are very pro-social justice and just want to talk to them about these issues, uh, which can also be exhausting um, because now this person has to uh, comfort uh, this white person or this non-black person um, who is trying to navigate their own feelings um, while the person themselves uh, is still traumatized and emotional and raw um, from all these things. And I know that Professor Johnson is going to talk about racial trauma uh, in a bit. And that's what all of this is about. It's just the many layers of everything that's happening right now. It it isn't just the systems. It isn't just the fact uh, that police officers have historically and systemically uh, been oppressive towards black people and that we need to defund the police and abolish the police. It's not just that. It's also going into uh, our various systems and navigating our various worlds and also dealing with various forms of oppression.
Now, the thing about microaggressions is that sometimes people don't know what to do with them because uh, they are different than what can be expected. Um, back in the day, when people used to experience more overt racism all the time, um, that's something that you could easily label, that you could easily identify as being racist, as being prejudiced, as being biased. I um, mean, in doing so, um, it's sometimes easier to even just externalize that situation, saying that person is racist, that person is awful, I want nothing to do with them. Um, but when something microaggressive happens, um, it's oftentimes a mindfuck for people, if I can say mindfuck. Um, but because it's that you don't know whether or not it actually happened. Did they really say that? Did they really mean it? Um, you don't really know if you're supposed to react to it, if you shouldn't react to it. You don't know if it's because of your blackness, because of your womanness. Is it because of your social class? Is it because of any number of things or all of these things all at once? Um, and so it causes this distress. Um, it doesn't, it's not something that's easily able to, that people are easily able to identify all the time. And so it takes up a lot of mental health uh, and a lot of mental energy um, as they, uh, as people navigate these sorts of things. Um, I, I mentioned this idea of intersectionality because if you're a person with multiple marginalized groups, um, that that's even more complicated because now it might not just be that a person is discriminating against you um, or uh, committing microaggressions towards you because of your race, um, but it could be because of your race or your ability status or your gender or sexual orientation um, and so forth. And so that's something that's also very important to have um, in these dialogues uh, because we, we oftentimes forget about people with these multiple marginalized identities. Um, and, you know, I want to, you know, just also pay, pay respect and honor to those who have been killed uh, who hold these multiple identities, not just um, women like Breonna Taylor or, uh, or Sandra Bland, uh, but also queer and trans people. This is June Pride, uh, Pride Month. Um, and we oftentimes forget um, that it was people like uh, Marsha P. Johnson, a trans woman, um, who started this whole revolution. Um, and we also times, sometimes forget about the trans and queer people that are being killed today. Um, more recently, Nina Pop and Tony McDade. Um, and in New York, people like Mark Carson and Elon Nettles um, and uh, Leilene Polenko. Um, these are all people with these historically marginalized um, identities, multiple identities um, that are oftentimes forgotten about. So what I want to talk about next is what do we do with these microaggressions? Um, when we experience these microaggressions, it can be a lot. Um, how do we react to these situations, particularly if we feel um, unable uh, to address these things, or if we feel that there's too much to lose? Uh, so for example, if you're in a classroom setting and your professor says something that's racist AF, um, are you going to say something knowing that that might affect your grades somehow, or they might hold it against you, or they might embarrass you in front of the class, or any number of things that we know happens and has been documented as, ha as happening to black students and other students of color and other students of other marginalized groups throughout history. Um, and so we make decisions like that. If you have an employer um, that says things like all lives matter, or says derogatory things about the people who have been killed, or even people who are currently protesting and fighting for our rights, um, is that a safe place for you to say something? Um, because that could cost you your job and you need your job in order to sustain um, your life and provide for your families and so forth. Um, and so these are some of the decisions that people have to make. Um, are you going to, um, to address every single microaggression? Um, sometimes it feels like you have to because if you don't, then you feel like no one else ev ever will and that that person will continue to make so these sorts of comments or engage in that sort of behavior. Um, and then at the same time, uh, sometimes you might just need to walk away for your own mental health and your own um, safety and your own um, regard because uh, if you're fighting all the time and especially if these are fights that are not going to be fruitful, um, is that really the best thing um, for your mental health? Um, and so when we think about, you know, microaggressions, um, I, you know, I, I hope that people uh, can, can learn uh, a couple of things. One is to have the language um, about microaggressions, to know that these subtle, more covert forms of discrimination exist, um, to know that if you're feeling something and it doesn't feel right, it probably is a microaggression, um, and to know um, that you're probably not alone. 
that this is because the system is the way it is and because the um, the culture of America is founded on uh, on anti-blackness and on uh, Native American indigenous genocide um, these things are so embedded into our culture and society that you would be surprised how something that you might feel is just a once something that's directed towards you has happened to hundreds thousands of people um, in their everyday lives um, and so to to know that you're not alone is something that's very important. Um, and the last thing I'll say about microaggressions for now um, is just this idea that um, we all can commit microaggressions. In this context, we're talking about uh, anti-Black microaggressions that non-Black people can commit towards, uh, towards other Black people. But there are lots of ways that other microaggressions that we might ourselves commit microaggressions based on gender, um, based on skin color, uh, based on sexual orientation, gender identity, even ability. So one thing that's been coming out a lot this week is just to be really mindful of ableist language that people are using um, as we talk about issues related um, to social justice. Um, and so for us to just be really aware of that. One thing that I know that I'm constantly checking and, uh, you know, trying to be aware of and be vigilant about is just what my impact is on other people, whether or not I know about it at all. Um, and so I have to be very mindful of what my presented gender is to people and how that might negatively impact. So as a man, to be aware of the ways that I might engage in sexism, whether or not I even intend it, and to be accountable for those times when those sexist biases um, might manifest. Similarly, as a non-Black person, as an accomplice, as DiCarlo said, um, for me to still check and be aware of any anti-Blackness um, that I have been socialized to believe that might come out, and to be open to, uh, to, to challenging that and to constantly checking that and not to rely on others to check it for me, but for me to check it myself. And so these are just some of the things for us to, to think about today. Thank you so much. That's an extraordinarily inclusive um, approach. And I think it, it does help us look at this question um, in, in, a, in a much broader way. And I, I think that's so useful for all of us, for the students and all of us. We got a question about this, this um, about microaggressions. And you raised this issue of um, the, well, I think one of the things about microaggressions is that the, the part micro can be somewhat misleading, right? And I think when you talk about microaggressive microaggressions, if we think about micro aggressive context, right? We think about the impact of, of this. And a student wrote, well, how does this impact this sort of microaggressive context? That is, how does this impact the fact that some police officers can watch other police officers engage in behaviors? That is, some of them are lethal, some of them non-lethal, but how can they watch other police officers engage in this behavior and still say nothing? Could you speak very briefly to that for us? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, the term microaggression does not have anything to do with impact. Micro has to do with the subtle ways that they might uh, manifest, um, but there's nothing micro about the impact of microaggressions. And so that's one thing, you know, when people first started using the term, so the term was actually first used by uh, Dr. Chester Pierce in the 1970s to talk about uh, anti-blackness that in the 1970s that, that existed. Um, and maybe there could have been other ways to describe this phenomenon, but this is what has stuck. And so to understand that micro doesn't necessarily have to do with the impact. Um, but the second piece I'll say in response to that question is that when it comes to police brutality, when it comes to police misconduct, there is nothing microaggressive about that. That is a part of a systemic power struggle, uh, system systemic abuse of power, I should say, um, that the police used and, and uh, uh, displace onto black people and, and people of other marginalized groups. Um, and so police don't, uh, because they have that power, they don't engage in microaggressions. They just engage in, in uh, oppression. Um, and so uh, microaggressions, what, 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 when I talk about microaggressions, I'm talking about interactions that people have with each other um, and aren't, a, uh, aren't, when we talk about police, we're, I'm thinking about systems and, and microaggressions uh, you know, are, are removed from that. There's nothing microaggressive about a police officer putting a knee on another police officer's neck or on, an, on another human being's neck and having other police officers watch that. Um, and so that's something that I hope is clear is that police brutality is not microaggressive at all. It's Thank overt. You. Thank you so much. That's, that's, that's a, a wonderful answer to that. And so we're going to turn, and, and Dr. Nadal raised this issue of the impact of the uh, microaggression. So we're going to turn to um, Dr. Veronica Johnson, who I've been on a panel with before, and it's lovely to see you again, um, who is a specialist in racial trauma. And so Dr. Johnson, can you just talk to us about, we've heard these sort of conceptual ideas around uh, institutional racism, microaggressions. But can you talk to us about 
how this actually impacts black people. How, uh, this is not just an intellectual issue. These are things that we feel. Can you talk to us about the, 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 the impact this, these things have on us? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to say thank you all for having me today. I am. I was so appreciative when you started off and you um, and you sort of centered this conversation a little bit around emotions and mental health um, because that's sort of what I'm coming in today to talk about, right, is sort of the psychological and emotional impact of racism on people of color, specifically Black people. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of information around racial trauma um, in the media and certainly on social media. And so I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to sort of clarify that language. Um, so generally, and, you know, bear with me, my abnormal psychology students who have heard this from me before, <laughs> but uh, trauma in general is, is a stressful event or a series of stressful events that overwhelm our ability to cope with them. Um, so something can be stressful, right? But it only becomes traumatic when we, it overwhelms our coping, me uh, our, our sort of coping mechanisms or coping resources. Um, so racial trauma is, is that, right? So it's sort of in, race-based incidents or a series of race-based experiences that overwhelm our ability to cope. And what it really looks like in an individual is it's complicated um, and complex uh, symptomatology, right? So we see that people who experience one really, really um, impactful or a series of um, race-based incidents manifest um, a number of different traumatic stress symptoms. One of those being hypervigilance, right? So being anxious and watchful of one's surroundings um, in fear of, you know, encountering another race-based incident. Avoidance, which is really powerful. So the person spends a great deal of energy and time avoiding situations and people and places that would, um, that are likely to result in, you know, re-victimization. Intrusion, so that's um, classic sort of nightmares and flashbacks about race-based incidents, along with a number of other secondary symptoms such as low self-esteem, depression, increased anger, and physical symptoms, right? So stomach unrest, headaches, muscle fatigue. Um, and so we understand that, you know, people who, just in the same way that people who experience sexual assault, sexual harassment, uh, combat, combat related trauma also manifest some similar symptoms in the instance where they um, experience racism um, that overwhelms their ability to cope with it. So, um, you know, and I, I think it's important to also discuss what can sort of prompt or trigger racial trauma. Um, and so like my colleagues have said, certainly overt, overt experiences of racism can uh, trigger racial trauma. So that might be being called a racial slur, a physical assault, and, you know, certainly witnessing some of these fatal incidents that we have been seeing for years, right? This is just one instance of that. Um, but, right, as Dr. Nadal has said, those covert or subtle experiences of racism actually end up being much more likely to cause racial trauma. And the reason for that is, again, what Dr. Nadal said, there's, it taxes us both emotionally and cognitively, right? Emotionally, we're having a really hard time. We're sort of doubting, um, doubting maybe our abilities, trying to figure out why, you know, someone might be treating us in this way. And cognitively, we're working through like, what do I do? Do I say anything? Could it have been about race? Could it have been about my gender? And so it overwhelms us completely, emotionally and both cognitively. And we, and it results in this real, um, this real sort of energy output in order to protect ourselves, right? So we're avoiding situations, um, we're highly watchful of our environment, and we are, um, and we are sort of um, experiencing, right? Re-experiencing intrusive memories of the event. So, you know, I'm, I, I tend to see a lot of information online about racial trauma, mostly with people using trauma to describe like the dis emotional discomfort or pain that people experience as they sort of witness some of these fatal incidents and, you know, sort of, you know, repeated exposure of police brutality and racism in our country. And I just wanted to clarify that, again, it's a, it's a complex set of symptoms that are not necessarily... Um, going to result from witnessing some of these things in the media, but that if they do result, that it's really, really important for a person to seek mental health support, right? So I'm so happy to hear that we have, you know, John Jay Counseling Services on the call today. Um, and I'm so happy to be here, you know, in my role as a psychologist as well, to help people to understand what this actually looks like. So over the past couple of weeks, I've seen people, you know, post on social media about feeling like high levels of fatigue, 
having a really, really difficult time turning off the TV and you know, stopping um, the social media usage because that is actually the hypervigilance. We want to know where it's coming from. We want to know who in our, you know, who in our workplace might be a secret racist, right? We want to know which of our friends are staying silent and which of our friends are sort of um, speaking up on our behalf. And this is another form of hypervigilant behavior, right? We're so watchful to make sure that we don't sort of re become re-victimized in our environments, that we have a hard time stepping away from media and social media. Um, the other thing is that we sometimes will, um, we sometimes will sort of uh, avoid um, spaces and conversations with people who are non-Black. And that's completely understandable, right? Because again, the fear is that we will be re-victimized if we open ourselves up and expose ourselves to white people and at um, and, and other times, you know, non-Black people of color. Uh, and then the last thing I'll sort of say about that too is that um, the one thing that, you know, is particularly important about watching all of these things in the news is that it actually ends up not sort of being the the most triggering thing, but it triggers us to re-experience our own racial incidents, right? And so when we see a Black man being killed by a police officer, that actually might not be traumatic to us, but what it does is start the cycle of us re-experiencing and having intrusive thoughts about our own experiences of racism. Um, and so I see some of you nodding because I think, I, you know, I, it resonates with you how it might not be seeing that video online that actually is traumatizing to us, but, the, but recognizing, right, and being reminded of the lifetime of subtle and overt racism that we've experienced or that we've heard from from our you know loved ones or our family uh, our family members um, that can actually be sort of re-victimizing and re-traumatizing for us. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Now, Doctor, I just a question came and I thought it was just so perfectly uh, uh, suited to what you've just talked about. A student asked, "How do you deal with the emotional toll of being black and showing up in spaces like work or or other obligations?" when you are mentally drained, how does, what are the strategies that one can use um, to, to make that work? Obviously you've mentioned mental health, but um, mental health care, but what else can one do? And I think we all want to know, um, how do we handle that? One of, I think, you know, the most sort of um, insidious and frustrating things that people might be going through right now is that, you know, is a feeling that I also share where you, you feel like the weight of the world is on you and then you walk into your workplace or you hop on a Zoom call and no one's talking about it. Um, and, and it's sort of like, is this something that only I live with and everyone sort of gets to navigate the world without the burden of racism and without the sort of re-victimization, re-traumatization that we're all going through. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I'll say to that is find your people. Um, and, I, and that's something that has been incredibly effective for me. Um, Dr. Nadal is one of my people, right? Um, and so you find the people in your environment, wherever they are, that can affirm you, that can validate you, and who are going to either understand your experience or work to understand your experience, right? So as Carlos said, find uh, you know, your people and those accomplices, right? And so sometimes that takes a little bit of work, right? It may not be in your academic department. It may not be in your classroom, but there are people out there who understand your experience and can provide social support when you need it. It's actually one of a, like a really, really effective form of coping with racial trauma is finding social support. That's um, not always going to be easy, but once you find those people, you'll find that there's a space to process some of these things and the healing can actually begin to happen. Thank you so much. I think that's a, a great way to end the segment on that note that healing is possible for us. Um, and that's something that I think we do have to remember as even as it, in moments it doesn't feel like that. And, I, and thank you for that, Dr. Johnson. Thank you all three. Thank you, Dr. Gordon Emhart. Thank you, Dr. Nadal. Again, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Carlos Hines. John J. President Carol V. Mason has been a legal pioneer and an exceptional voice for equality and fairness throughout her career. As a United States Assistant Attorney General during the Obama administration, Mason led the Office of Justice Programs and supported an array of criminal justice agencies, juvenile justice programs, and services for crime victims. At the Department of Justice, Mason also took on the mantle of building a better community trust in the justice system through strategic programs and partnerships. Mason is John Jay College's first female president and first president of color. In this role, 
Her focus is Mason aims to equip the next generation of leaders with a comprehensive justice focused education and to promote a nurturing environment that fully supports educating underrepresented populations. Mason earned an AB in mathematics at the University of North Carolina and a JD from the University of Michigan Law School. It is my pleasure to introduce our president, Carol V. Mason. Okay, good evening. And you caught me off guard, Carlos. I was busily writing notes and I wasn't prepared to stop yet. <clears throat> so um, first I wanna say thank you for this um, really powerful and informative conversation. Um, I can tell how powerful it is by the fact that I've got four pages of single space tightly written notes from just the first part of this conversation. Um, whenever I um, participate in, in these forums, and when I say forums, I mean opportunities to learn from our professors, um, it's so enriching for me um, and, and something that I am privileged to be able to have the ability to do as president. Um, I like to show up in classes and things and sit in the back and learn with everyone else because I think that that's what's special and important about John Jay is that none of us have a handle on all of us. We've got to constantly learn, constantly engage with each other, constantly push each other. So I had a meeting, was it just yesterday? No, it was Tuesday. It's hard to tell Tuesday. the hard to tell the days of the week in this environment where you're still look, looking at the same screen every day. It's just people move around on the squares. But for me, um, for those of you who read my statement, let me give you a little bit of deeper context in the statement that I put out to the college and why it took me time to write it. Um, and, you know, when, when Dr. Johnson was talking about um, how we cope, and she said, you know, find your people, well, what I had to do, let me back up. So for me, what happened with George Floyd in particular was um, especially difficult because um, in 2014, when I was the head of the Office of Justice Programs, I pulled together money, um, strong-armed lots of folks to get together money to create the National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. And the goal of that, we, we, we designed that program because Professors at John Jay um, wrote a letter to me at the Department of Justice after Trayvon Martin, before Ferguson, and said, the Department of Justice needs to do something about this and can do something about this. There is research that shows there are promising practices and things that the Justice Department ought to invest in. So um, unbeknownst to them, after I got this seven page letter, may have only been five, felt like seven, um, and met with the group. I went radio silent because then what I did was worked with my colleagues across the department to figure out how we could come up with a way to use this research. And I wish I'd known more about your research, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Nadal, um, to weave that into it as well. But that's why we're at John Jay, we can still do that. But we put out an RFP and John Jay um, in combination with um, Yale Law School and Phil Goff was at that time at UCLA. Um, they, they submitted the proposal that we funded that, that brought together the concepts of procedural justice, implicit bias, and racial reconciliation to figure out how we go into communities um, with law enforcement to um, break that cycle of distrust between law enforcement and communities, particularly marginalized communities, to prevent by that time, by the time we announced it, Ferguson had happened, and we wanted to figure out how do we prevent this from ever happening again. So when I saw that video, and, and, and some of you heard me say this before, I'm, I'm nearly 63, I may tear up, I'm okay, I'll keep going, but this is emotional, as, as Dr. Johnson talked about. So when I saw that video, I left out one step. Minneapolis was one of our six pilot sites. It was a place where we were testing this work, to bring these concepts together to prevent Michael Brown from ever happening again. And what happened in Minneapolis was exponentially worse than anything we could have ever conceived of. And as you said, it's on film and we see it day after day after day. 
And, and so when I saw that, um, I fired off an email to David Kennedy, who runs the National Network, who is our primary investigator on that grant. And I said, I am so angry, but we need to talk as soon as I can calm down. And so when, 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 when I want to keep saying Veronica, but I've got to say Dr. Johnson, uh, talked about how you cope. For me, I needed to withdraw for a moment because to me, it was, it was um, so hard on multiple levels the incident itself, feeling it as a black person, feeling it as a woman who has nephews and brothers who could, this could have been, they've been stopped by the police and this could have been them for nothing. This could have been them. But I also felt like I had failed because of what happened, because of the four years we invested in that police department to prevent that from happening. Then I had to sit and think, and then I, then I called David and asked a lot of questions to find out what did we do in Minneapolis? What was the response in Minneapolis? What was happening in Minneapolis? So that I could begin to digest and understand because I don't want to give up on this work. That's the other thing. I, this incident should not cause us to say that we stop this work. It's, it's, I had to dig in and figure out, okay, why did this happen here? What else should we be doing? Then my next coping mechanism was I wrote an op-ed piece that has yet to be published, but they tell me it's still gonna come out. Um, that was part of my processing as I had to write about it. And then, because I had to write about it as me, then I could be presidential. And you know, you talk about giving people space to process and how do you react? And we've got all these different roles that we play. And I needed to process me before I could be the, the play the leadership role that you all were looking for me to play. So I'm, I'm through that and ready to play the leadership role. And here's why I think that John Jay, and I'm so glad that you all are having this town hall and I'm anxious to continue to learn um, because we have an opportunity at John Jay because of our origins as a police college. And because John Jay was created in, in the, in the sixties when there was another period of social unrest because of disparities and disparate treatment and racism, and they wanted to educate police officers to help them be better, um, um, better serve the communities in which they operate. We've got, we've got a special place because we've got all of you all who are teaching us about what racism is, what oppression is, what microaggressions are, what the traumatic impact is, and we have the ability to make sure that our future law enforcement officers are steeped in this research, steeped in this understanding, and have the relationships with all of you all, who I've said before, will be protesting them. And so there's that relationship and that understanding. And, and, and so I think that we at John Jay, with, with the leadership of our students, the leadership of our faculty, have an opportunity to show the country a pathway forward about how do we begin to really dismantle these systems? And how do we um, come up with a path forward where we can all be supportive and respectful and want to see each other succeed? Because now this may be controversial for some of you all, but we still need law enforcement. But the question is, what's the proper role of law enforcement? And I subscribe to the view that law enforcement's role is to help create safe communities where everybody has an opportunity to thrive. And the question is, how do we equip them to do that? And how do we equip communities to be healthy, whole, and survive? And that's where the question comes in about how do we invest in our communities? Where do we put our resources? Uh, my, my pastor at church always says, you can tell a lot about your priorities by looking at our checkbook. And that's the same concept that we need to be looking at in terms of our, our governments. And we all have a responsibility and a voice to use with our governments about how our tax dollars, because everybody pays some form of tax. If you buy anything, you've paid tax. If you work, you pay tax. You pay tax in some form of fashion. So this is our money they're spending, and we've got to use our voices to talk about how are we spending it. And so, so the, 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 the learnings have to do with much more than um, building community trust. It's also a part of understanding, again, what the proper role of law enforcement is, what's an appropriate use of force and when do you use it? How do you de-escalate? And so there are a whole package of, of things that, that, that need to go into this um, solution. 
And John Jay is uniquely poised for that because of the research that happens here at John Jay. Um, and because of, of the students we're educating at John Jay, everybody wanting to, to approach whatever it is you choose to do with your life from a lens of, um, is it fair? Are we creating a more just world? Whether you're a scientist, an artist, law enforcement officer, lawyer, advocate, we all have a responsibility. And that's the key thing is, it's not somebody else's job. It's every single one of our jobs to figure out how we move forward and how do we um, create a path where, um, I saw somebody's child on the phone earlier, where, you're, where you don't have to worry about the safety of your child when they leave the house. So hopefully you're gonna ask me questions, Carlos. Um, I don't wanna just speak. I wanna engage with folks. President Mason. Uh, oh, go ahead, Carlos. I'm sorry. No, Dr. Davison have one question for President Mason, and then immediately following that question, uh, we'll move to um, Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey. Wait, can I see? Where is Chuck? Is he on this? Oh, there you go. So can you unmute him for a second? So Chuck. You got to unmute. They unmute. So anyway, All right, the, other, the other day when I found out you were going to be on the town hall, because they just told me Tuesday, they called you way early. You're much more important. And I said, I've been trying to get this <laughs> number. How'd you find him? So they've got better skills than I do. So I am so glad you were joining us today. Thank you. For Madam President, I'm, I'm honored to be here and to be a part of this very uh, important discussion Thank that's you. taking place. And once again, John Jay is leading the way. Well, Chuck was a great partner with a lot of the reforms and things we've been trying to do. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Let's go to the introduction of uh, Police Commissioner Ramsey. Oh. Charles H. Ramsey was appointed Police Commissioner of Philadelphia Police Department on January 7, 2008. He retired in January 2016 after serving eight years as commissioner and leading the fourth largest police department in the nation. Commissioner Ramsey brings over 47 years of knowledge, experience, and service in advancing law enforcement profession in three different major city police departments, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia. In December 2014, President Barack Obama chose Commissioner Ramsey to serve as co-chair of the President's Task Force on the 21st Century Policing. Former Commissioner Ramsey has long been at the forefront of developing innovative policing strategies, evidence-based initiatives, organizational accountability, and neighborhood-based programs. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and it's really an honor uh, to be here with all of you uh, today. And like President Mason, I hope that there's a question or two that uh, comes after a very brief presentation. I know you've heard from a lot of different people uh, today. Uh, I don't want to repeat too much of what was said, but I don't think you can emphasize enough just how important it is for people to voice their concern and their disgust over what took place, not only in Minneapolis, but things that we've seen around the country. These things should not occur. Police reform is needed, and it has been needed for a very long period of time. But this time, I've been asked a lot, you know, what's different about this? Well, I'll tell you what I think is different. One, it's been sustained over time. And it's unfortunate that we have incidents take place. Um, you know, there's, there's concern and, and maybe even some unrest or outrage for a period of time, but it, then it kind of starts to fade away. You can see very clearly this is not going away. And it, it comes at a time when, you know, our, our country's been in crisis almost all year. When you really stop and think about it, you know, we're dealing with COVID-19. Uh, uh, people, uh, of, you know, understandably concerned. It's had uh, an um, uh, adverse impact pri primarily on people of color, Black people in particular. Uh, you add on top of that uh, the economic situation we find ourselves in with job loss. Who gets hit the hardest on that? Black people. I mean, and now you turn on your TV set and then you see the murder of a man 
on TV by a police officer who had his knee on his neck. And, and what's so different about that? It's almost like watching this man just die in slow motion. I mean, you could not mistake for a second what was taking place. It was totally, totally unjustified. And so when you look at the protest and the demonstrations that are taking place on the street, you're seeing not just black people that are out there being angry, you see a wide range of people, diversity out there. People are fed up with what's going on. And there is a, uh, a culture, a toxic culture that exists in policing, not every police officer, but it's there. And I think we have to acknowledge it. You know, we've been using this whole, you know, there's just a few bad apples. Well, the few define the many. And one of the good apples going to speak up about the bad apples, if you want to use that. I mean, you know, to, 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 to watch that video was disgusting. But just as disgusting was watching three police officers fail to take any action, not intervene. When you look at Buffalo, and you see the officers push the 75-year-old man. Now, I don't think they planned on knocking him down, but it happened. But when you see a man laying there with a pool of blood, blood gathering around his head, you've got to stop and render aid. You've got to help him. And I'm listening to people try to explain, well, you know, uh, that we're taught to, and no, we're not taught to move on. That is a rare situation, and I'll tell you exactly where it comes from. Training that you get if you're dealing with an active shooter in a school or something where the urgency to find the shooter and stop it is, is, is so critical that, yeah, if you come across a wounded person, the entry team has to move on and find the shooter. There is a medic, uh, medical group that comes behind you that'll take care of that. This was not an active shooter situation. This is a demonstration. And, and, and not many, I mean, it couldn't have been any more than three people out there to begin with. So what's the threat? And so that kind of nonsense I'm glad it's come to light. I'm glad it's on video because now we can finally face facts and actually go about change. And change is so important. You know, um, I'm a lot older than all of you uh, that are watching. I, I, I'll, I'll just Not take a chance to say all of you. Know, <laughs> I think I got you too, Madam President. <laughs> uh, but I, I, you know, <clears throat> sometimes people wonder, well, you know, is this the incident that'll change? Is this the tipping point? It's too early to say that, although I'm optimistic that maybe it is, but just to kind of give you an example of how one incident can actually change, change the world. In 1955, a woman riding a bus, tired, didn't feel like giving up her seat to a white man who back in those days in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, that was expected, mm -hmm. segregation. And she said, no, she got arrested, and that led to the Montgomery boycott, a bus boycott, which led to the Civil Rights Movement. And then decades later, it led to me one day becoming police chief in Washington, D.C. and in Philadelphia. Those things never would have happened had it not been for the, for the bravery of the men and women who stood up to injustice back in the 50s and 60s and beyond that made a difference for people like me that came along later. It'll make a difference for all of you. And there's a lot at stake. There's a youngster right now somewhere, maybe not even able to walk, maybe hadn't been born yet, but what you're doing today is gonna affect and influence their opportunities in the future. But in addition to taking the streets, which is important, because it gets people's attention, you gotta vote. Now, there are a lot of people that say, well, you know, the system, blah, blah, blah. It may, I mean, listen, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but guess what? It's all we got. It's all we got, right? That's not going to change between now and November. I guarantee you that. Vote. Get all your friends to register and vote. Don't pass up the chance to let your voice be heard in a way in which not only uh, a president or vice president, senators, what I'm talking about local elections as well, state, local. Have your voice be heard. To not let your voice be heard, then don't complain when things go the wrong way. And don't complain when a person gets in an office and you say, oh, so-and-so got elected. Did you vote? 
And if the answer to that question is no, then we need to move the discussion somewhere else because you blew your chance. I mean, it's just that simple. It is not really that hard. So while we're out there on the streets or while you're out there on the streets doing what you do, talk to people. Have you registered yet? Have you, you know, what are you going to do? Doesn't matter who they vote for you. To me, it matters who they vote for. But the point is to vote. Vote. And I think that's a part of it. You know, black people, we have to we have to show and demonstrate that, you know, our voice is powerful. It means something. It's not just paying lip service. We can make a difference. And collectively, we can make a tremendous difference. And we're not just doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for the generation that comes later. Because that's really what it's all about. And that's how each generation gets stronger than the generation before them. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it should be, in, in my opinion. I've been very fortunate. I came along at the right time. When I was, in, I, I was born and raised in Chicago, grew up on the south side of Chicago. And um, I remember I accidentally became a police officer. My father drove a bus for the Chicago Transit Authority. My mother was a nurse. My dream um, coming out of high school was to become a doctor. I wanted to study medicine. And uh, I was actually a pre-med student at the University of Illinois when I was working. I wasn't a scholarship kid. And for those of you that are paying your own way, you know what it's like. I was working, trying to help, you know, pay my tuition and so forth. And um, a couple cops would come into the store I was working in because one of my sister was a cashier. I grew up in a community called Inglewood on the south side of Chicago, which is a pretty challenged <laughs> area. And they came in to make sure we were okay. And over time, kind of struck up conversations, and they told me about a cadet program. And what was, in, in, what was enticing was the fact the city paid your tuition, and there was no obligation to become a cop. You cannot beat that. So I joined. And it turned out that that was my calling. It was what I was meant to do. And I've spent 47 years active uh, in policing. Um, it's got its flaws. But let me tell you something. As bad as this may look, and right now, as angry as you are, many of you need to consider seriously a career in policing, in law enforcement, whether it's becoming a, a lawyer to become a prosecutor or a judge or a police officer or whatever it may be. Change comes from within. You can do it from outside as well, but real change needs to also occur inside. And you can only do that if you are inside. And so I would encourage you to not just block it out, at least think about it, because we need, we need people like you in our profession. Change the dynamic. Change what we currently have. And, and you have the power to do that. So I, I don't want to say too much more right now in case you want a question or two, but I can't tell you how honored I am. And when uh, uh, DiCarlo sent me an a email and Madam President, I have to see to it that you get my email address. Oh, I, I, found it. I got Ron okay. to give it to me last week. But when I read it, and it, <laughs> it said it was the Black Student Union at uh, John Jay, I didn't hesitate. I mean, and as soon as I opened it up, I said I'd be glad to. And believe me, I, you know, I mean, I've been doing a lot of interviews, and a lot of stuff, but I wanted to fit this in because it's that important. And I wanted to spend time. And when this COVID thing is over, I hope I get invited up so I can actually personally come up to John Jay once again and have these kinds of discussions because we want to keep this dialogue going, keep it open. And I'll be candid. I give you my word. I'll be candid. We ought to be able to talk about this thing and not just try to spin it to look any particular way. It is what it is. And it won't get better if we don't face it. Commissioner, so with that... Thank you very much. It's been, it's, first of all, it's just an honor to have you join us today. Um, we are, that was um, both informative, but also for me, at least, very inspirational. I haven't been feeling as, as hopeful as I could be. And, and that actually inspired me. And I do appreciate you joining us and, and sharing your wisdom with us. As you can expect, we got a lot, we have a lot of questions for you. So yeah. I'm going to try to condense them for the, in the interest of time. But the question that seems to come up um, from students generally has been about this idea of dismantling the police force, right? So this idea of both defunding and entirely abolishing the police force. Right. And one of the student questions is asked, what is a, a model for pu policing if there is no police force? How would we deal with 
violent crimes in the absence of a police force. And so, um, and, and I guess a follow on question to that, and it's sort of the same, but the question the student asked is, with calls to completely abolish the police force and law enforcement agencies of the country, what would a world look like without them? Could you just share some ideas of what you think about this move to defund slash abolish police forces? Well, first of all, I wish we lived in a world where you didn't need police. And I firmly do believe that part of the goal of policing ought to be to put ourselves out of business. In other words, we can create with long with the community such safe societies that we're not needed anymore. But guess what? We are a long, long way from that. And so when I hear calls to defund, and I've been on interviews and people uh, have explained what they mean by that, they're talking basically for the most part about reallocating funds from police departments to social service agencies, for an example, to be able to have, you know, uh, community-based uh, um, social services uh, for people that need them. So whether it's substance abuse counselors or mental health uh, treatment, um, and I have absolutely no objection to that at all. I think it's a tremendous idea. The question is, how is it going to work in reality? And the reason why police are first to respond to uh, people in a mental health crisis or first to respond if there's another issue with the drugs, uh, drug trafficking or what have you, at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, the police are the only ones out there. City services, I mean, try calling them after 5 o'clock. That's no knock on them. They just don't have the funding and they don't have the staffing. And it's going to take time for them to actually build that staff if they are, in fact, going to be available. And there are some calls that they go to where it's not really safe. And so police will never be able to pull back entirely because, again, there are going to be some situations where they're going to need backup in terms of having police officers there to be able to deal with it. Um, we live in a time right now, unfortunately, in this moment in time, where cities, states, and even the country are in a recession. I mean, COVID has hit us hard economically. And so to think you're going to be able to fund sufficiently the ability to have those kinds of resources, I have my doubts. Now, that's not to say it's not a good idea. It's just to say, is it realistic? As far as abolishing departments, I don't think you throw the baby out with the bathwater. But what you have to do is there needs to be a reimagining, if you will, of policing in America. We need to refocus. What is it that we really need police to do? What are the, who are we bringing into our ranks? You know, we need to be doing better in terms of hiring and psychological profiles and, and, and that sort of thing. So we need to really think about what we want to do. You asked the question, uh, Professor, about you know, uh, what, would, what, what would we have in the absence of police? You'd have vigilantism, and you don't want that. I mean, you look at the Arbery case. That's what that, that was, at vigilantes. People take it in their own hand. Who's going who's gonna to investigate that rape? Who's going to go out and deal with that homicide? Um, not just the investigation, but actually apprehending the individual who committed the homicide. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of crime and violence out there. That doesn't mean that police don't need to do their jobs different. What I have found in talking to people is that, well, most people that I have talked to, and I'm sure there are many others, and I respect their opinion, uh, but people that I have spoken to, it's not that they want no police. They want good constitutional policing. And that's not asking too much. They want to... They wanna, uh, 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 they want to be able to call police and not fear that they're going to overreact and wind up you call somebody to uh, uh, help a relative that's having a mental health crisis and you don't expect them to get shot. You want good constitutional policing is what people want. A good friend of mine, Ron Davis, who is the executive director of COPS, President Mason knows very, very well. Uh, he had a saying in talking about public safety in general. And he said that when you talk to people in the neighborhood, people, and, and how you measure safety, how you measure uh, uh, public safety, that was the context. And what he said was, and I think it was, it was pretty uh, profound, he said, um, public safety should not be measured solely by the absence of crime. People are looking for not just the absence of crime, they're looking for the presence of justice. And that's true. People want justice. They want fairness. They want to be, be, be treated 
with, with even, even people that commit, there's no need to disrespect even the people that you have to arrest for whatever reason. And so we have to give them that. Otherwise, you're going to get calls for, let's get rid of the cops, let's do this, let's do that. I don't think you have to do that. I think reform can happen. In fact, I know it can happen without it. And I'm hoping this current movement that's out there will keep the pressure on and force all of us, those in law enforcement, those that, that, that uh, make decisions to, to, to really make change. But don't forget, that's only the tip of the iceberg because racism and inequities exist way beyond just policing. And we have to address it all. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Ramsey. We have a ton of questions coming through uh, the chat for you. Uh, but what we'd like to do is uh, ask if you can stay on a little bit longer with us. Yeah. And uh, we're going to move uh, to our next speaker and then we'll, we'll answer those questions towards the end. Is that okay? That's fine. Fantastic, thank you so much. Sean King might be new to many of us, but he has been on this path his whole life. In 1999, Sean became the youngest student government president elected at Morehouse College since Dr. King was student in 1947. Before he was ever nationally uh, known, Sean was a popular high school history and civics teacher in Atlanta, then a traveling teacher and counselor at a dozen different jails, prisons, and youth detention centers in Georgia, speaking and teaching five times a day five days a week for many years. He's adopted social media to rally and unite people of desperate backgrounds and has now become one of the most followed activists in the world. He uses his platform as a journalist, now for the Harvard and the Intercept, and formerly as the senior justice writer at the New York Daily News, to unearth the truth behind local media and to organize all of us in purposeful and directed ways. Moreover, he reminds us that we can take whatever we do best, whether we lobby, we speak, litigate, protest, write, and more, and tilt that towards justice. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Sean King. Hey, good to see each and every one of you here uh, it's, it's my honor and privilege. I wish so much that I could see you all in person. I see so many of you that I know well here. Um, I'm in Brooklyn. I'm in Crown Heights right now. And uh, I'm just sorry that we don't get an opportunity to um, to be together. I, traveling and speaking and, and seeing you all in person is one of my most favorite things. And so I'm sorry. I know for all of you who are still here in New York, uh, I don't know that the world really understands just how much it's impacted our city and our community, but um, it's my honor to be here. I'm very excited that just moments ago, uh, thanks to the, the the fearless work of activists and organizers on the ground and volunteers all over the country, that the Louisville City Council just about an hour ago passed what they're calling Brianna's Law which is the full ban on no-knock warrants. In fact, it's the strongest ban on no-knock warrants of any city in the country. And they were considering a partial ban, but just moments ago, they voted, Democrats and Republicans voted 26 to nothing unanimously for a complete ban of all, of all no-knock warrants. And had such a ban been in effect, it would have prevented Brianna Taylor from ever being killed in the first place. And what many of us know, and what every study bears out is that no knock warrants are rarely used in white communities, because they're dangerous, and they're deadly. And I've seen grandmothers be killed in no knock warrants. I've seen little children, including babies, be killed in no knock warrants. And had Brianna's younger sister, who actually lived with Brianna, but happened to not be there that night, been in the front room, uh, experts have all said that her sister would have also been killed that night as well. And so that's not justice, but it is change. And it's a change that, uh, that we fought for. I see that type of change happening all over the country. And just two weeks ago, many people thought 
it would be an outrageous demand for the Louisville City Council to completely ban no-knock warrants because not a single city in the country has a complete ban on them. And so they did what no other city has done. And I think it speaks to what it means to, to have lofty goals, to, 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 be, to be hopeful, to be determined, to not, to not fight for the small thing, but to fight for the whole thing. And that's what activists and organizers in Minneapolis did as well. Uh, just brilliant activists and organizers on the ground there didn't just fight for simple reforms, but fought in essence to change the whole system. And their city council uh, in Minneapolis uh, has agreed that they're going to dismantle the entire police department in Minneapolis, not just add body cameras, not just add implicit bias training, not just tinker with the system, but what many of you, and I see so many of you who've studied this and know it well, what we have to come to accept is that this thing, whether we call it the criminal justice system or the justice system or the legal system, it's not broken. And something that's broken needs to be tinkered with. It needs minor adjustments to be fixed. This system's not broken. Instead, it's actually functioning exactly the way those who designed it and imagined it is functioning exactly the way they intended it to function. And in fact, this system is probably one of the highest functioning systems in this entire country. <laughs> it's doing exactly what it was designed and built to do. It's not broken. It, <laughs> it was designed as a tool of oppression. And in that regard, it is doing exactly what it was built to do. That's why when we fight for justice for someone like Breonna Taylor, who still does not have justice, the officers who killed her have not even been fired, more or less been charged. The reason it's so difficult to get justice in these cases is that this system was not built to give us justice. It was built to oppress us. And anytime we try to squeeze it and force it to do something it wasn't actually built to do, we struggle. And so young people and organizers in Minneapolis said, no, no, we're not here to tinker with it. We want to dismantle it and build something beautiful in its place. And I heard uh, Commissioner Ramsey say something that I think is incomplete. And, and, I, and uh, I'm not here for a debate, but, but I have to correct something. For generations, we have said vote. And the thing is, I want all of us to vote. And I'm a voter, and I've worked on presidential campaigns and Senate campaigns. I run a political organization. But just saying vote is not enough because actually the city of Minneapolis is completely run by Democrats, from the mayor to the city council. I live in New York. Our mayor is a Democrat. The entire city council is a Democrat, are Democratic. Our governor is a Democrat. Our attorney general is a Democrat. The entire state legislature is run by Democrats. This is not me saying I'm against Democrats, but I'm saying that we have cities and states and counties completely controlled by people that we actually voted for that aren't doing right by us. In fact, we're seeing some of the worst cases of police brutality in cities that are completely controlled by the people we voted into power. And so it's, it's too simple to say, if you want this to change, vote. Because a lot of the people that we voted for promised us that they would do right by us, including our mayor here in New York, Mayor de Blasio, and many others who actually ran on a platform of holding police accountable, but there's been almost no police accountability. So we have to get way more specific than voting. We have to be more specific than saying vote for a Democrat because we have voted Democrats right down the line. We have to get to the point where we're really saying not only what is it that you stand for, but we have to look and say, what is it this person has actually been fighting for? That's why I'm, I am leery of people who promise us that they will do things that they've never actually done before. And so we have to vote people into power 
who have a real heart and soul commitment to changing this system from the inside out. I think those people, some of you may be on this call. You may be here with us on Zoom. Some of you need to run for these positions with a, with a real commitment to change the system from the inside out. I want to tell just a quick story. I moved, I lived in Atlanta for almost 15 years and, and I moved my family to California and I Googled, um, we were going to, my job was in Orange County, which is the county right below Los Angeles. And uh, my family and I Googled safest cities in, in Southern California. And at that time, the safest city in America was a city in Southern California called Irvine, California. And so my family and I moved all the way from Atlanta to Irvine. And I had been there for about three weeks. And I realized that I hadn't seen a single police officer, not a police car, not parked anywhere, not giving anybody any tickets. And then I started realizing, like, I'm not seeing police anywhere. It was three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks went by. And I never saw a single car anywhere in the entire city of Irvine. Finally, I asked a friend of mine, like, does Irvine actually have a police department? He took me to the police department. This is a city with almost 500,000 people. It's a significant city. And he showed me the police department, which was hardly bigger than a house with a few police cars. And what I realized is that the city of Irvine, which was the safest city in America, hardly had any police. We have to ask ourselves, how could it be so safe if they don't have police? Well, let me tell you, it wasn't because they didn't have drug problems because my kids went to high school there. Kids had drug problems. Kids were selling drugs, doing drugs, taking drugs. But guess what they did for those kids? They sent them to treatment. Guess what? There was no homelessness. So nobody was being prosecuted for being poor. Guess what? When there were domestic disturbances, people went to counseling. They weren't arrested for it. They treated substance abuse like a medical problem. When somebody had a mental health crisis, guess what? They took them to the hospital. And so Irvine found a way to be safe. Yes, because people had good jobs. They had good hospitals. There were no food deserts. There were grocery stores everywhere. Irvine found a way to be one of the safest cities in the world with very few police because so many other systems were treated fairly. And so when we say we want to defund the police, that's not necessarily an anti-police statement. It's just saying those funds could be used to do so much more. And the truth is, if you go to the safest neighborhoods in most cities in all of America, you won't find police. And you have to ask yourself, how are those cities safe with no police? But when we want a safe community, they want to flood those communities with police officers. And so we have to figure out what's our new definition of safety? What's our new definition for healthy? And how do we get there? I'll, I'll agree with Commissioner Ramsey on this. It's a process. It won't happen tomorrow. It, 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 it's, a, it's a process of something that we'll fight for for months and years. But we have to do it. And I believe we're in a moment where we should be fighting for lofty goals like our lives depend on it. And what we see is that our lives do depend on it. Uh, Brianna's life depended on it. She was an essential worker. And I wish that something like a no-knock ban had happened a week before she was murdered. But we owe it to the future Brianna's for there to be no more no-knock warrants all over the country, including right here in New York which still has them. And so uh, let's continue to, to fight for good. You know, I think we have some time to take some questions, but I love and appreciate each of you. I'm proud of all of you students who uh, fought hard to get through this semester. And uh, I, have, I have children who are in elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. And so I know how weird and difficult this semester has been, but I'm proud of each of you for doing what you're doing. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. King. It's really a pleasure to have you join us. I know the students, I, from my mailbox, I can tell that the students are delighted to have you with us. And we've got a lot of questions. I know President Mason has a question, but I'll ask the student question first, and then we'll circle back to President Mason, if that's okay. Um, so 
the question that we got um, is how do we keep the revolution going when the protests end? And it's a question about the sort of the durability of this, right? And the student asks, it says that um, he or she is educating him, uh, himself on history uh, and trying to support black businesses, but I really don't feel like I'm doing enough. How, the, the question is, how does this, what do we do next? You, are, you really are answering the seminal question of this, of this conversation. What do we do next? How, what do we do when the protests end? Well, I think in some form or another, protests are going to continue. And a lot of people are surprised that they're continuing. I think people have been pushed far past the, the, their limits. We've, been, we've demanded justice for generations and have seen so little justice and so little change. I think what you're experiencing now is kind of an intergenerational frustration. And so I don't think the protests are going to stop because the injustice is not stopping. In fact, three people were killed by American police just yesterday. Four people were killed the day before. Their names have not gone viral. There haven't been hashtags. Their stories have hardly been told. I'm fighting for a young man in Vallejo, California named Sean Monterosa, who was shot and killed by the Vallejo police. So there are cases that have not yet gone viral I don't think the protests will end, but even if they end temporarily, we have to understand that when we organize in smart, effective ways, when we can find ways to put aside our differences, which are often based on style and not necessarily substance, we can put aside our differences and focus and organize, we can overcome so many barriers and so many obstacles. That's what happened in Louisville. That's what happened in Minneapolis. Uh, the Austin City Council is now almost at a veto-proof majority to reduce their police budget by nearly 25% and then do, as many people have said, reallocate those funds to provide services for substance abuse and homelessness and education and job training. Um, it, the name of the game is, is to be able to organize and protest simultaneously. I, I, if I can illustrate it for you, often our anger is here, but our organization is here. And we have to find a way to get our, our organizing and our frustration on the same level. And, and so that doesn't necessarily mean we have to reduce our frustration. We should be frustrated. It's, it's healthy to be frustrated. It's unhealthy to maintain all of this anger uh, and pretend like you don't have it. And so we have to find a way to be energized and organized. And I think that's where we are right now. And uh, I think you're also seeing the quality of our goals. It, the quality is going up where now we're saying, I want to see your budget. I want to see the budget of the city. I want to see what the city actually prioritizes. And that is as sophisticated of a goal as I've ever seen. And you know, Dr. King said, budgets are moral documents. They reveal your morality, your integrity, your priorities. And we often say we prioritize A, B, and C, but if your budget doesn't reflect that, then you don't really prioritize it. And what we have found is that in cities like Los Angeles or New York, police departments are now taking up as much as 50% of the entire general fund of a city, 50% of their budget, which is, an outs which is a, just an outrageous number. And so it's all about figuring out for each of you who are listening and, and for your friends and your family and your network, figuring out what your role is, figuring out what your cause is. I would encourage you to dig in locally, partner with local organizations. Uh, we started something called the Grassroots Law Project. You, I, we would love to have you a part of that. But if there are local groups that you want to be a part of as well, uh, jump in. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be experienced. Many of us, when we began doing this work, had very little practical experience. But you can, when you match your energy up with somebody else's energy, you can get so much done. You very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, President Mason, I think you had some comments you wanted to make. Yes, as I say, it's not a question, it's a, it is a comment. So thank you and thank you 
um, Sean for joining us and thank you Chief Ramsey. What I wanted to say is because people are going in and out, so I'm not sure that everybody's caught all of the pieces, but I hope those of you who are here heard consensus because we're all on the same page and we're all saying the same things, we're using different words. But in terms of the question about is the, what to do when the protest is over, the protest should never end. And as Sean said, it's a question of what does the protest look like and, and, and being organized. And one of the things that the Black Student Union here at John Jay did was you were very specific about what you wanted. And so you're making it easier for us to um, implement your recommendations, your demands, because you did the homework for us. And I think what you're hearing us say is, is what Chief Ramsey was saying about voting, that's a first step. But we also talked about, we all talked about that you've got to show up and be involved in your communities, use that voice, use your power. Um, and I'll go, and I also want to put in a plug for the census too, we got to be counted. Because those resources that are going to get allocated, they're not going to get allocated to our community the way they ought to be if we're not allowing ourselves to be counted as being here and in our communities. So, so I'm ecstatic by what I'm hearing today because we're all talking about, um, what was it you said, um, Carlos, when we talked the other day, you said that you all were, were uh, I wrote it down, the intellectual, anyway, you were, I'll take too long to find the page. But anyway, you all are, are combining your, your intellectual um, savvy with social activism now. And I hope that you continue to, that. that's what Sean was talking about, the frustration matching, matching up with the organization. You guys have the tools, and guys is a generic term to mean everybody for me. And, 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 I, and I look forward to watching our John Jay students be the leaders in teaching us how do we keep this going and how do we push this change. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Mason. We had a, a another speaker um, who was unable to stay because we were just a bit off time. And it's Professor Eliasa Shabazz of John Jay, who is also the daughter of Malcolm X. And she was going to bring um, a perspective in on the sort of social justice aspects of this of this moment we're living. But since um, Professor Shabazz isn't with us, we thought we would use this opportunity to take a few more student questions. If you all are able to take just a few more, um, that's okay. Um, Can I so, just say that we, you all all missed a treat and you need to invite her back because she's amazing. She's really amazing. Um, I think I'll start with this question. And President Mason, this is a question for you, actually, because I was going to ask you this question earlier. And it's um, someone had made a comment about the um, the sort of the, the real sort of laser like focus on the police department. But as, as lawyers, I know that we, and I think all of us in this, people at John Jay, we understand that the criminal justice system, of course, is much more than, than policing, obviously. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is to hear what you think about um, these other central parts of the criminal justice system, that is lawyers, uh, and as the prosecutors, judges, public defenders. Um, there's an incredible role um, that these people play in creating the system that we see, right? And I think sometimes our focus on policing obscures their role. Could you speak to us yeah. about that very briefly? Yeah, so uh, yeah, the operative word is briefly. Um, oh, yeah. So, so, so yeah, and I heard you. Okay. Um, so so the, the thing I want people to hear is that when we tackled this issue at the Department of Justice, when I launched the National Initiative for Building Trust and Justice, we started with the police because I didn't have enough money to go everywhere. And Ron Davis at the cop's office gave me three million of that six million I raised. Um, but we knew that policing is where it starts because that's where most people have an interaction with the justice system is through policing. Um, most people don't, thankfully, don't get to see the prosecutor or defense counsel or judges. But we knew that we needed to work this through the whole system. Now, and I take Sean's point about the system is doing what it's designed to do. He's absolutely right. Jeff Robinson with the ACLU does this wonderful um, program around our, the laws that of our country and how they came to be. He's absolutely right. But um, I, I think that, that we've got some prosecutor's offices on this call. I saw some names I recognized. I won't call them out. But I need you all, our students, to become prosecutors too and not just defense counsel because prosecutors, they influence what happens with police. So the DA in Brooklyn, for example, um, his, his wife is a lawyer 
who was a school teacher first and went back to being a school teacher instead of a lawyer because she wanted to interact with young people and change the system. And she challenged him in saying, I don't want to see young people coming through your courthouse. I don't want to see young people prosecuted. And so he sat with all of his prosecutors and said, this is what we're going to be focusing on, not these other things. And when the police see that the cases, certain cases aren't going to be prosecuted, you stop arresting for it if the prosecutor is not going to prosecute on it. And then when the judges, we also need to work with our judges and we need you all to become judges because when the judges understand the communities in which they are judging, we have different results. We have, you know, our commencement speaker last year uh, from Red Hook changed, transformed that whole court system because you don't, um, as Sean said, the, the reason why Irvine is safe is because they treat things that are health issues as health issues and not criminal justice issues. But the problem that, that, that Chief Ramsey articulated earlier is because of failures in other parts of our system, which we are seeing revealed by COVID, the police are there as the safety net that shouldn't be the safety net. The safety net ought to be investing in education, investing in job creation, investing in, in creating healthy communities. And because we're not doing that, and there are many reasons why we're not doing that. People will say they're limited resources. Well figure out how to better use the resources we have. So anyway, the long, that was a long answer to your question that I was supposed to be short, but policing, police are just a piece of a larger puzzle that needs to be addressed. Thank, thank you very much. That's, I think that's extremely important. Um, and as you know, I think so much about our students becoming prosecutors and judges because that is a central part of, of, of changing this, the, the way that this situation looks. Um, the question I think now is a question for the faculty on, on the call. Um, and one of the students wrote in to say that anti-racism racism seems to have become trendy. And it seems, to, it seems to be the way that we are going to discuss what's gonna happen now. It's a buzzword for what's going on. Do you believe that anti-racism should be reflected into the curricula from kindergarten through higher education? Um, and I, I throw this out to the faculty members who are still in the call. Uh, if any faculty will raise their hand to answer, I will unmute you. Okay, uh, Dr. Veronica Johnson. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I appreciate this question because it's something that uh, you know, I get asked a lot and it's, it's the type of work that I've actually been involved in for many years. And so the question, uh, excuse me, the answer to the question is absolutely. Um, but I think, you know, and I appreciate the, the sort of observation about the trendy sort of aspect of anti-racism right now, because people, I think, completely underestimate what it takes to become anti-racist not just uh, reading a few books. It's not just acknowledging that racism exists. It's both sort of an intellectual process and also a deeply emotional process. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically uh, for white people who I've worked with in anti-racist training, it's a very emotional process to start to dismantle all of the, you know, sort of socialization that you have um, and to come and, co excuse me, and confront um, how embedded racism is in your own sort of way of being. Uh, so that can be deeply emotional. It can be, it can bring up feelings of shame and guilt. And so when we talk about being anti-racist, one of the really difficult things about encountering white shame is that it's debilitating for most people. Um, in the same way that if, you know, any of us experience shame, right? It's not an emotion that allows us to sort of move forward. Um, and so when we talk about anti-racism, it's not just reading an Instagram post. It's not just posting a black square. It's about doing some very deep, interpersonal work on oneself uh, in order to understand who they are as a racial being, who they want to be. Um, and so I'd prefer for people to just keep their black squares uh, and do the work instead, which is, which is deep and complex. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, we got another question for Commissioner Ramsey. Um, Commissioner, the question from the students, it says, um, based on your experience as police commissioner, do you believe the presence of paramilitary police, particularly when dressed in their riot gear, escalates tensions at these peaceful protests? Do you think that their mere presence sets the tone for violence and is actually counterproductive to their goals of maintaining order? You can unmute yourself now. There we go. There okay, we go. all right. 
Uh, yeah, I do. Um, one of the things I learned, especially when I was police chief in Washington, D.C., which has more than a share of protests, uh, some got uh, pretty dicey back in the early 2000s with the IMF World Bank uh, protests that we had in D.C. at the time. Um, one of the things that, that I've learned over time is that when you are in a situation where you, you, you're dealing with a, a demonstration, uh, a lot depends on how you're, how you appear. And so um, if, if you're in a regular uniform with what we call a soft cap or baseball cap or what have you, uh, and kind of monitoring what's going on, um, you know, the crowd reacts one way. The minute you put on riot gear, then it, it, it totally changes. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that there may not be a time when you need that because when rocks and bottles and stuff like that get thrown at you, you've got to, you've got to be able to protect yourself, but there is a correlation. And I think it's important mm -hmm. that uh, officers be mindful of that or their leaders be mindful of that. And if you do have to don that gear, then deescalate just as soon as you can. What I saw during these protests, especially like in DC with uh, Lafayette park, Lafayette square, um, those were federal police, but it doesn't matter. I mean, that was totally uncalled for and inappropriate. Just so, I mean, it was just so heavy handed that it really kind of caught me off guard because of all the places in the country that I think are so accustomed to handling um, uh, demonstrations is Washington, D.C. And you, you just, you rarely see that. In fact, I don't remember seeing it. So uh, that kind of heavy handedness, yeah, it sets off all kinds of things. The same thing with uh, it, it, you br uh, bringing out certain equipment. I'm not a believer in the tear gas and all that stuff. I had a, in, in um, uh, 17 years as a police chief, never, never once, never once used it. Uh, in fact, I had a policy where it could only be used on my order or my first deputy's order. And we were on the same page with that. And I, that was not something you could do. We didn't even have rubber bullets. Uh, that was a surprise to me that that even, you know, that they, they use that in, D, in uh, Philly too, but we didn't have them when I was there. Why? Because of the, 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 the injury that could cause, and it's just, it's heavy handed. And so, whereas you may have to resort to uh, crowd formations and things like that, you've got, you've got protesters. And then in some cases you'll have counter demonstrators that you have to keep apart. You have all kinds of dynamics going on sometimes in a protest. Uh, and sometimes you do have to move a crowd, but it's, the, it's how you do it uh, that really makes the difference. So, yeah, you can actually escalate things very easily if you aren't careful. Um, so you have to be prepared, but at the same time, you know, let the, let the crowd demonstrate that you need to do that as opposed to you just assuming that you've got to, you know, wear all the, all the gear and, and all that kind of stuff. I just, I think it's a mistake. So can I just add something, Chuck? So when, we, when I was in the Department of Justice after Ferguson and seeing all that, we put out strict rules and forbid departments from using the, the we took away the tanks. And, and again, going back to who you vote for matters, they undid all of that work that we did because when I saw, again, what the president, I don't call him that, what he did to clear that street for a photo opportunity, it was the antithesis of years of work of making sure that law enforcement did not have a military presence because they're not, there's a reason why we have military and we have police because our military officers are not supposed to be doing domestic work and our police officers are not supposed to be the military. It's very, very different. But, um, and you did see some bipartisan pushback again, because we, we already fought this, this debate and there was bipartisan support. We'll see if they've got enough strength to stick with it this time, but that should never happen. Law enforcement should never come in with a military presence. Exactly. And we have uh, Dr. Nimhard who wants to make a comment and then immediately following her, I'll come back. And I will unmute you now. Okay, you're on. Thanks so much. Yeah, I wanted to add to that um, answer about teaching anti-racism. Um, yeah. 
The other piece of why it's so important to talk about anti-racist curriculum, and we've been using the term now decolonizing the curriculum, is because, um, and this is from kindergarten on up, right, the narratives, again, this is where structural and institutional racism come in, the narratives about who uh, creates knowledge, about where knowledge comes from, about who our scholars are, about whether history starts in uh, Greece or, or not, right? That all gets set into people's minds that there is no history in Africa, there are no black people who are scholars. So that we, that has to get changed from very early on. Students have to see themselves in the work, in the research. They have to see that people create knowledge who aren't just old white Europeans, or they need to understand that even the Greeks, right, learned at almost everything from uh, Alexandria and Egypt, right? They need that context and they need to understand that their, their heritage is also equally in the knowledge and the things that they're being taught from the very beginning. And so I would also argue for that piece um, for us to remember that side of it also. Thank you so much. I, I think we have, this conversation obviously could go on for hours. I think we have, um, I'm getting the message that we've reached the limit, but I wanted to extend my personal thanks to all of you for joining us, to all of the participants who were on this amazing panel. I think we've gotten um, lots of perspectives from different viewpoints, but I, I, I feel that President Mason is, is correct that w there is consensus, right? We, we all realize that, that there's a need for change here. And so I wanna thank you all. I wanna thank all the students for joining us. And I'm gonna turn this back over to the students. Um, I'm gonna turn it to Carlos to, to close out, but I wanna say my own thank you and thanks for joining us all. Thank you for moderating Dr. Davidson. We definitely appreciate your hard work and the late nights we were up uh, putting this together. Uh, before uh, we close out, I do want to remind everyone that we do have Dr. Uh, Bryant who is on the call. He will be staying on the call after everyone leaves. For those who want to speak with him, um, uh, if you've been triggered by the conversations that we've been having or if you're just feeling uh, some, some emotions that you want to express due to what's going on, we definitely have Dr. Bryant available immediately following uh, this session. Uh, I want to uh, remind everyone that Dr. Bryant's services are to students only. Um, and not to faculty and staff. So uh, students, you are definitely welcome to stay on with Dr. Bryant. Thank you to all of our guests, Commissioner Ramsey, uh, Sean King, President Mason, um, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Nadal. We thank you so much for being a part of Dr. Nemhart for being a part of this conversation and, and helping us put together uh, this uh, Black Student Town Hall. Thank you so much to the executives of the Black Student Union, Kiana, um, Yolanda, uh, Gina, Ranisha, uh, the <laughs> VP. <laughs> thank you so much for your hard work and dedication. And thank you uh, for everything that, uh, for everyone who have attended. Stay tuned, there is more to come for sure.